Hello and welcome to week three, part two of EGM 703, Surface and Atmosphere Interaction. In this lesson, we'll cover how microwaves interact with the Earth's surface and atmosphere. We've seen this slide before, but I'm including it here as a reminder of the different ways that electromagnetic radiation interacts with the Earth's surface. We'll be expanding on this as we go, but this is a good place to start from. This is another slide that we've seen before, but I'm going to make one addition for this lesson. From microwave remote, from microwave radiation or microwave remote sensing, this fact means that we can derive emissivity, which we need for applications of passive remote sensing, using measurements of reflectance, which we get from active remote sensing. So we have a nice synthesis of these two different approaches here. So we've mentioned quite a few times already how electromagnetic radiation is a self-propagating wave. Most of what we've considered, though, is based on electromagnetic radiation propagating in a vacuum. We need to also consider how it propagates through different media. We've been mostly focused on the atmosphere if we're not thinking about vacuums. But microwaves can actually penetrate into different media, so we now need to also think about what it is that we're observing. So it turns out that this depends on the material's electromagnetic properties. That is the electro electric permittivity epsilon. And yes, it annoys me that this is the same variable as we've been using for emissivity, but we'll press on. The electric permittivity describes how susceptible a material is to becoming polarized by an electric field. That is how well it can store or transmit electric charge. The next property is the magnetic permeability, denoted mu. This describes how a material responds to a magnetic field. A higher magnetic permeability means that the material is more likely to become magnetized. Finally, we have electric conductivity, denoted as G. And this depends on how mobile electrons in a material are. In metals, for instance, electrons can move freely throughout the material, meaning metals have a high electric conductivity. They're really, good they're really good conductors of electricity. From Maxwell's equations and the theory of the and the theory of electromagnetism, it turns out that electromagnetic waves cannot propagate in a conducting material, because the electric field component induces a current in the material that dissipates the energy of the wave. As a result, electromagnetic waves are almost totally reflected by conductive materials. For non-conductive materials, also known as dielectric materials, the electric permittivity is the most relevant, and it's the one that we're going to be covering in more detail. So the electric permittivity describes how an electric field interacts with a dielectric material or medium. It describes how well an electric field polarizes the molecules in a material, or how well the material transmits the electric field. We normally describe the permittivity of a material relative to the permittivity of a vacuum, epsilon naught. Here, epsilon r is just a dimensionless value that relates these two quantities. Because the interaction of an electromagnetic <laughs> Because the interaction of an electromagnetic wave with a material causes a change of phase of the electromagnetic wave, we often consider permittivity as a complex number, with epsilon prime corresponding to the real part of the permittivity and epsilon double prime corresponding to the imaginary part. You may also hear or see the term dielectric constant. Most of the time, dielectric constant is only referring to the real part of the electric permittivity, epsilon prime. As an electromagnetic wave travels through a dielectric medium, it interacts with the molecules or atoms of that medium, causing it to lose or attenuate energy. If we look again at the different components of the electric permittivity, the real part, epsilon prime, is or the dielectric constant is lossless. The imaginary part, epsilon double prime, tells us about how the material absorbs electromagnetic radiation. It relates to the energy loss as a result of propagation through the dielectric medium. One thing to keep in mind is that this attenuation happens exponentially. That is, 
the amplitude of the electromagnetic wave decays exponentially as a function of depth in the material. We can estimate the depth, or distance, at which the amplitude is reduced by a factor of E, Euler's constant, using this equation. This depth is known as the penetration depth. We can see here how it depends on the different components of the electric permittivity, as well as the wavelength that we're observing at. As long as the real part is larger than about 10% of the imaginary part, and as long as we can ignore scattering effects inside of the material, then this approximation holds. For microwave remote sensing, most materials have at least some penetration depth, with the exception of liquid water and materials such as very wet snow. At the risk of spoiling things for you, it turns out that liquid water, which plays a massive role in the dielectric properties of a material, is extremely important in microwave remote sensing. A very small amount of liquid water on a surface can completely change how that surface appears using radar. At boundaries between media that have different dielectric properties, electromagnetic radiation is somehow redirected or scattered. For example, the ordered redirection of electromagnetic radiation from a smooth surface is something that we've seen quite a lot. We've just been calling it reflection. Most of the time when we talk about scattering, we mean a random redirection of electromagnetic radiation. For example, this could be through absorption and re-emission of radiation for small diameter particles, or it can mean physical scattering of radiation for larger particles. Think things like pool balls bouncing off of each other or bowling pins. We have two main cases of scattering that we'll consider in, in microwave remote sensing. The first is scattering from surfaces, which happens when the area of the scatterer is much larger than the wavelength. And the second is scattering from objects, which happens when the area of the scatterer is about the same size as the wavelength. Depending on the size of the particle, we have three main mechanisms or types of scattering that we might see. Rayleigh scattering is caused by particles with a diameter d that's about one-tenth of the wavelength of light. Usually this is atmospheric molecules such as oxygen or nitrogen. The amount of Rayleigh scattering also strongly depends on the wavelength of the light. It's proportional to 1 over the wavelength to the fourth power, which means that blue light scatters about at about 400 nanometers, scatters about five times more than red light at about 700 nanometers. This is, for example, why the sky appears blue to us during the day. Blue light is scattered from all portions of the sky relatively uh, evenly. Rayleigh scattering is also partly why the sky appears red or orange during a sunset. Near the horizon, the sun's light travels through more of the atmosphere, and as a result, shorter wavelengths are more preferentially scattered away from the observer, and so the light that we see tends to have longer wavelengths. Mies scattering is caused by particles that are between one-tenth and ten times the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation. This is usually caused by things such as dust or smoke particles or even smaller water droplets. The amount of scattering that we see depends less on wavelength than Rayleigh scattering does. Rather than one over lambda to the fourth, it's only one over lambda. If you've seen any of the apocalyptic uh, or horrific images from areas affected by wildfires over the past couple of years, for example Australia in 2019-2020, the dark orange or red skies that you see in those photos is a result of, some, of the process of knee scattering. Dust storms can have a similar effect when it's caused by the same mechanism. Non-selective scattering occurs with particles that are bigger than about 10 times the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation. It's called non-selective because it scatters all wavelengths equally. This is caused by large water droplets or ice crystals, usually in the form of clouds. From the ground, clouds normally appear white to gray, owing to the relatively even scattering across different wavelengths. Another classic example of non-selective scattering is fog. The dull gray color of fog is caused by even scattering of relatively low levels of light. We can measure how effective a scatterer is using something called the scattering cross-section, or sigma. 
The scattering cross-section as a function of direction theta is the ratio of the scattered power per unit solid angle into the direction that we're measuring from to the intensity of the original plane wave divided by 4 pi to make sure that it's also in units of power per solid angle. For radar systems, we call this the radar cross-section, and it's the ratio of the received power to the power transmitted by the sensor multiplied by 4 pi multiplied by the distance between the transmitter and the target r squared. From this, you can see that we should have units of area, or meters squared. Because this depends on the resolution of our radar sensor, we normally divide this by the area of the object to get the normalized radar cross-section, sigma naught, which is also sometimes called the differential uh, radar cross-section. This is one of the fundamental properties that we measure with radar remote sensing. Because it is normalized by area, it is unitless. It's a property of the thing that we're observing, the target, not the measurement geometry of the system. So we can cat categorize scattering from surfaces into four main categories. The first of these is scattering from a smooth or specular surface. For microwave remote sensing, a very common example of this is calm water bodies, because the water surface reflects almost all of the signal away from the sensor. The second is scattering from a rough surface, and we can break this into two different categories. In the first, randomly rough surfaces, this is including things like agricultural fields or low vegetation like grasses, um, Scattering from periodically rough surfaces is called Bragg scattering. Common examples of this might be wind-driven ocean surfaces, where we get this regular pattern on the ocean surface as a result of the wind, or we might see crop types that are planted in regular rows, or similarly, agricultural fields that are plowed in a regular pattern. So these regular patterns cause scattering that is known as Bragg scattering. The third type of scattering that we're going to be looking at is scattering from corner or edge reflectors. And these are surfaces that very effectively reflect electromagnetic waves back to our sensor, and so they appear very bright. These can include buildings or other human-built structures. Some natural surfaces can also serve as corner reflectors. The scientists will often go out and deploy large corner reflectors as part of uh, as part of a satellite observing mission because they're easily detected in an image and because we can measure their precise location so it helps us to calibrate and geolocate our radar systems. Finally we have volume scattering. So a volume scatterer is composed of randomly distributed scatterers and the signal that we get returned is due to elements inside of the media rather than the surface of the media. And this is, again, in part because microwaves tend to have some penetration depth into most media. So how much volume scattering occurs from a given surface is going to depend on the wavelength. But some common examples that we might see include things like dry snow, deep dry sand, dry soil, or forests, and even ice. Just to be clear here, when we say a surface is smooth, what we mean is that the irregularities of the surface are much smaller than the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation. Surfaces like asphalt and tarmac can appear smooth at microwave wavelengths, even if the surface would appear rough to us because it's the scale that's important here. Conversely, we say that a surface is rough if the irregularities are of a similar size as the wavelength or if they are much larger than the wavelength. In addition to the properties of the surface, the amount of scattering that we measure will also depend on the incidence angle, similar to what we've seen in previous modules for visible and infrared remote sensing. At microwave wavelengths, Earth's atmosphere is almost completely transparent. We can see here that after about 5 or 6 millimeters or so, the atmospheric transmittance is very high. This includes clouds. One of the major advantages that microwave remote sensing has over visible or infrared remote sensing 
is that it is often very independent of weather. We can make observations day or night, even with heavy cloud cover. As you can imagine, if we're studying polar regions, this is especially useful. The one big exception here is the ionosphere, which is the ionized or charged portion of Earth's atmosphere. It ranges from about 50 kilometers above Earth's surface to about 950 kilometers above Earth's surface. By ionized, we mean that there are lots of electrons and charged atoms and molecules floating around. And this is part of what gives us the aurorae, or the northern and southern lights. It can also make microwave remote sensing more of a challenge. This happens in particular through a process known as Faraday rotation, which is the rotation of the polarization vector, or the vector that the electric field is oscillating in, as a result of traveling through a charged medium in the presence of an external magnetic field. Depending on the wavelength or the frequency of our sensor, this actually changes what we measure. The example here, from a paper by Wegmuller and others uh, from 2006, shows the effects that this has on estimates of surface displacement derived from L-band radar. This is a signal with a wavelength of about 24 centimeters. So on the left, we have the estimated offset in the range direction. We'll talk more about this uh, in the next couple of lessons. In the center panel, we see the estimated offset in the azimuth direction. And again, we will cover what that means in the next lessons. So notice here the very clear bands of blue and green that we see in the azimuth direction. And on the right, we have the estimated ionospheric azimuth offsets that are due to Faraday rotation of the received signals. So we can see that most of what we're actually measuring in the azimuth direction here is due to this Faraday rotation. And so if we're trying to look at how these glaciers are moving, it's going to be a lot more difficult for us to actually measure that motion because of this uh, apparent motion induced by the ionosphere. So again, depending on the application that we're interested in, these kinds of processes might be very critical for us to understand and be able to correct. So in this lesson, we've discussed how microwave interaction with a material depends very heavily on the electromagnetic properties of that material. We've also recapped how scattering or redirection of electromagnetic radiation takes place at the boundary between different media, for example, at the Earth's surface. For microwaves, because of the long wavelengths involved, we see primarily non-selective scattering in the atmosphere, if we see it at all. But the exact mechanism that we see scattering on the surface is going to depend on the smoothness of the surface or boundary relative to the wavelength. Finally, we've seen how the atmosphere is mostly transparent to microwaves, although the ionosphere can pose a significant problem depending on our application. You can read more about the topics we've discussed here in the textbooks, Lillisand, Kiefer, and Chipman, Chapter 1.3, Campbell and Wynn, Chapters 2.5 through 2.6, or 7.4 to 7.6. I've included a link to the paper from Wegmuller and others, uh, which shows the ionospheric effects on estimates of surface displacement. And I've also included a couple of links to some videos here, one that covers scattering and why the sky appears blue to us, and the other covering specular and dis diffuse reflection. So that's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Bye!